Hi, welcome to this session. And uh, for the next talk, we have a very, very interesting um, professor by the name of uh, Professor Ada Yonaf. So, Professor Ada Yonaf was born in Jerusalem, Israel. And after studying chemistry at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, she earned a PhD from the Weizmann Institute of Science, to which she has remained, uh, maintained her ties as a researcher. Now, in the 1970s, Professor Ada Yonaf began a project that culminated in 2000 in her successful mapping together with other researchers of the structure of ribosomes, which consists of hundreds of thousands of atoms using X-ray crystallography. Now, this was a very, very mammoth task. Despite steep odds and widespread derision, she persevered. She overcame the instability problem by using ribosomes from tough bacteria strains found in the Dead Sea, hot springs, and nuclear facilities waste. And after 25,000 searches for the right crystallization conditions, she succeeded in obtaining the crystals. For her seminal work, Professor Yonaf was awarded the 2009 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And today, should be telling us some of the interesting findings called the fruits of curiosity. Professor Ada Yonaf, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, until now, I came to, to Singapore to GYSS meetings many times, but it's the first time that it is on flat Zoom. So you, you heard what I was interested in, and I will show you now the type of, uh, of uh, um, science we are doing and the results. So let me just share the, share the screen. Okay, so the unified process is for, for producing proteins is going from the, the genetic coding DNA, <coughs> transcribing it to RNA, because here the code is inside the, the double helix, these the colored lines. You can see that there are only four colors and each color is uh, representing one letter in the genetic code. Each three of them are uh, coding for one amino acid in proteins, we'll come to it later. But the code here is masked by the structure. And therefore, the first, uh, the, the first uh, um, act in producing proteins according to their genes is transcription to a very similar molecule called messenger RNA or the RNA molecule that can exist also as a single strand, not only double strand like DNA, and therefore it is uh, readable by the ribosome that produces accordingly, translates it to proteins. So we like to, once we, we know how ribosome works, we like to represent it as a factory that makes proteins, like uh, in, in here, and, the right side of the slide. And it is made of, sorry, of two, floor, of two floors. In the top floor, the messenger is being read. It means when three nucleotides that are coding for an amino acid that is brought by trucks, which are also RNA molecules, transfer RNA or DNA, when a code here, three nucleotides that code for this amino acid is coming to be translated, this amino acid will be, will be connected to the newly grown protein in the, lower, in the lower floor. So the upper floor is for decoding. And peptide bond, the bond between two amino acids or all amino acids is done in the lower floor. Uh, this, this, uh, arrow had to be inside, but I don't know to draw inside, so please forgive me. 
and imagine that it happens in the lower flow. Then the protein will be one amino acid longer. The messenger, the message will progress by three nucleotides, it means one codon. And the, the truck that carry the amino acid will go out empty. And the whole, the whole uh, process takes a little bit of energy. It's very efficient, but it needs energy. And uh, uh, then all the, all the uh, participants in this process are ready for the next amino acid. So the two, the two floors of the, of the factory are actually in the ribosome, two subunits, the small subunit and the large subunit, SSU on top and large on the bottom. This is the way it is. Oh. I can't understand what happened, okay? So ribosomes are built of two subunits, as I said earlier, they associate to a single particle for translation when it's needed, when the, when the cell needs it. The small subunit decodes, as I said earlier, and the large subunit makes the, in the large subunit, the, the bonds are being formed. So uh, in vivo, there are many, many ribosomes and they help continuously. They can make 40 peptide bonds. It means the bonds between the amino acids, the letters of the proteins, 40 of them in one second with hardly any mistake, mistake between half a million to one million, with hardly any. It, as I said, it can make up to 40 bonds in one second. I, as a very fast student, needed six hours for one bond. So as you saw earlier, the ribosome is made of two subunits. The, the small one, the decodes, and the large one where the bond is being made, they are connected by many contacts between them and by the tRNA that from one side it's, it has the codon, and from the other side, it carries the amino acid. The decoding center is where the codon is being read. And the PTC, which is peptide bond formation site, is where the bonds are being made. So once we understood the structure, once we determined the structure, we also understood the function. And with two students of the Art Academy, we made this little video where the messenger is reaching the small subunit. And you can see that on the small subunit, there is this blue thing. This is an initiation factor. Bacteria had, has three initiation factors. We have many more. So the ribosome will not start working unless it is being initiated by several factors. You see one of them. And the messenger, this is the line going into its path within the small subunit. Once this is fine, the first tRNA, the first truck can come with another initiation factor and bind to its position. And then the two factors can go away. Here is the tRNA with the amino acid and the large subunit is coming to the small one making contacts, making bridges, and the active ribosome is being formed. You can see it here in solution on top of the large, below the small, and the amino acids are formed by tRNA with elongation factors into the ribosome. They are being decoded, decoded on one side, and the peptide bond is being made on the other side of the tRNA. And the ribosome helps in, out, in, out, as you can see. So we took away the large subunit. You can see the decoding being done here on top. And the peptide bond being done here between the amino acids. And the newly born protein goes into a tunnel, which exists only, sorry, it's the only thing that we show from the large subunit. So now you can see the whole ribosome again. The large subunit is in place. You can see how the ribosome helps in, out, in, out, 40 times a second. And the protein, this blue thing is coming out from the lower part, coming out and folds to its 
correct or almost correct uh, folding with or without help of chaperones. And the whole process continues until there is a stop codon and then a release factor, this, uh, this uh, gold thing comes in, finishes everything, release the two, the two subunits, and the protein, this blue here, the, the blue round thing, the global arm, goes to do what it needs, and the rest of the system is waiting. Very, very simple and very clever way. So actually in the movie you saw something not very well defined, that the ribosomes are well defined and we know exactly each of their components. Most of them are made of RNA, again RNA, ribosomal RNA, which is now in green in the small subunit and in the large subunit and ribosomal proteins that we show here in many colors, and there are 80 of them. So the decoding happens in the small one and peptide bond in the large one, as you could see earlier. So there is a huge number of ribosomes that function in each cell. Mammalian cells may contain millions, like five millions in the liver cells. Even bacteria contain about 100,000. Because of the vital role played by the ribosomes, almost half, over, over 40%, almost half of the clinically useful antibiotics target protein biosynthesis, mainly by paralyzing ribosomes. So actually the natural antibiotics are the weapons that one organism, one microorganism is using to fight another one. And we are taking advantage of it. And I will show you four examples for how the ribosomes work. So uh, um, immediately after we determined this structure, we did also that. This is adenine, a very small antibiotic, this yellow thing that disturbs the messenger RNA, blocks the path. That's all what it does. The second one is also very small. Actually, all of them are small, and it occupies the position of the second tRNA. One is bound and the second cannot bind because its position is occupied. It's called tetracycline. The third one that you will see is, uh, this is going into the tunnel, the tunnel through which the newly born protein goes out of the ribosome, it blocks it. You see it blocks it, just sitting in the tunnel and blocking. And there is a whole, a whole family of antibiotics coming out of this one. It's called erythromycin. It came into use directly after penicillin, the first of ribosomal antibiotics. And the large one, the last one that you will see is the cleverest. It goes into the bond, into the position of the bond. See here, just sitting in the bond. So these are clever antibiotics that are designed by bacteria against bacteria. And we are using those that don't disturb the, the, the human or the animal, the eukaryotic ribosomes. Just to remind you, we saw four types of antibiotics. They all, they all disturb the ribosome, either at the decoding, the bind here. All these bubbles show positions of antibiotics. Or in the bonding, where the bond is being made. Or in the tunnel, or those that disturb these motions that you saw in the movie. The, these are the, the four uh, most common positions of antibiotics. Since antibiotics are, are, sorry, since the ribosomal active sites are hardly concerned, antibiotic selectivity, it means the clinical usefulness of antibiotics is based on minute variations in the ribosomal active centers. And I will not show details now, just telling you. But I do want to talk about resistance to antibiotics, which is one of the most severe problems in modern medicine. 
and I'm sure that you know it, but I must say it. And I want to highlight how it is being formed. The bacteria profit from accidental mutations. They have many mutations. And once there is a mutation that develop, develop a resistance or cause resistance, this is the mutation that will stay. These are type one type of mutations. There are actually several types, but it does matter. There is resistance now to all of them, and resistance grows from probably from minute to minute, most likely. So it seems that we will revert back to the pre-antibiotic era during to the resistance caused by parasite by the simple or severe infection. And people will die from it in young age, like pneumonia on wounds. These were almost untreatable and resulted in frequent deaths in the past. And the World Health Organization called it post-antibiotic era. And consequently, the World Bank estimated that up to 3.8%, almost 4%, of the global economy will be lost by 2050 because of resistance to antibiotics. It means now there is pandemic and a virus and all what you know about, but there are also other problems in medicine and this is really a big problem, the resistance. Yet very few new antibiotics are in development by the most drug company. The most drug firmas, but the pharma companies, have stopped attempts at creating antibiotics owing to the huge difference between the social value and the, it means our life and the high expense needed for creating new antibiotics. So you can see here in, in the, the two tables, on the left side, the increase in drug resistance, about three types of uh, uh, pathogens, so three types of bacteria. And in the right, the amount of new antibiotics. So this, this uh, uh, increase talks about a 12 years difference between 1919 and 2002. And this, the number of antibiotics is the total since 1980 to 2014, just this number, hardly any. So it's a, a problem and we decided to do whatever we can. So we have some most contributions toward controlling or combating antibiotic resistance. And our, our concept of fighting or controlling bacteria's wisdom is identifying bacteria, pathogen-specific essential structural motifs for the ribosome, on the ribosome's periphery. So let me say some, some words. But bacteria's wisdom is the bacteria way of staying even in the in staying alive and even multiplying, even in the presence of antibiotics, because they can create resistance. And what we want is instead of making new antibiotics for the whole bacteria, to look at those that cause diseases called pathogens and look at, at specific sites on the periphery, on the outside, far from the active site, so the bacteria don't know about them yet. So for this, we determine the structure of ribosomes for pathogenic bacteria and compare them to ribosomes of harmless bacteria. And we had many lessons. And I'll show, I'll show you only a few of them. But the general lesson is that all bacteria ribosomes are similar. <coughs> Sorry, excuse, excuse me. But not, they are similar, but not, not identical. And we are looking at the difference between similar and identical. So uh, uh, lesson one, two, and three, I don't show. I show lesson four, which is beyond my expectations be because we found novel antibiotic binding sites, new antibiotic binding sites, 
as I said earlier, on the periphery. So if you look at the left side, it's the skeleton in gray, it's the skeleton of harmless bacteria, and the little additions here in Cyan are showing what pathogen, a pathogen specifically, Staphylococcus aureus, but it has a addition to the, to the um, uh, normal, to the harmless large ribosomal subunit. So altogether is less than 8% addition, but it's not the number that matters, it's the fact that all these, there are other places, but all what I show here are on the surface and they have their own structural uh, shape, specific motif. So if we look, for instance, at this one, in more detail, we can see that most of the, of the environment is identical, but this piece is extra. Here, this, this is this piece. So if it's extra, it may be a potential binding site. Actually, there are more potential binding sites on this. And uh, in, in a model system, we identified 25 new potential binding sites and we block them one by one. It means we, we made this like this thread, blocking this one and another one here, another, but one by one. And we found that 16 of them inhibit protein biosynthesis. And since these sites are not involved in primary, in primary ribosomal activity, pathogens have no genes against them. This means that so far, no bacteria assigned vital role to these sites, but they are needed for the cellular uh, 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 needs, cellular, cellular uh, um, reactions. So meanwhile, there are not, there are no um, uh, antibiotics against, and uh, there are no resistance against them, and we are employ, uh, employing, employing them for making degradable antibiotics and envi that are environmental friendly. I didn't talk about this, I want to say a few words, but I want to show you some of the sites that uh, we, we, can, we could target. And I want to show you lesson number five, which is selectivity and similarities, mainly selectivity. I think that you all know about the microbiome, which is a collection of harmless bacteria residing in the flora of semi-exposed mammalian organs like guts and ears and lung and skin. Most of them are extremely useful, but they can be, they can be um, helped by the normal, but the useful antibiotics, the currently used antibiotics. And our new antibiotics are not going to harm them because they're looking for specific pathogenic sites. Also, there are environmental and ecological consideration because most of the ribosomal antibiotics have uh, inter, inter, in, internally caused that are not digestible and also not biodegradable. So when they go out into the, into the environment with the sewage, there are some uh, a purifying machinery that does not, does not catch them because they are so small, so they can penetrate back into the irrigation system or even drinking system and increase being consumed and even more, make more uh, resistance. So, the inhibition by the hours, by our newly identified potential sites, was in, in, achieved by the molecules that we designed. And we could design them to be either a biodegradable or a, not poisonous and so on. So, so far they are composed on, on oligon, oligonucleotides, oligopeptides and similar molecules, and we can optimize them in terms of chemical properties, but also in terms of antibiotic action and in degradability. So in summary, the new insights obtained from these high resolution structures of ribosomes from a genuine pathogen 
provided you need chemical tools for several things, but uh, mainly for suggesting novel signs, which I uh, showed you, suggesting how to improve clinical performance. I didn't show you, but we did something in this uh, direction too. And for better distinction between pathogens and useful bacteria space, spacing. And what we are producing are pathogen-specific antibiotics. That mean the design of antibiotics drugs specific for each and every pathogen, in contrast to the current performance of broad range antibiotics. So we are aware of the problem, the economical problems of, of uh, uh, companies that don't agree to do any new, any new type of uh, research on new antibiotics, but we hope that pharma companies will consider human aspect aspects, not only profit. So what we want is to minimize resistance. We don't think that we can get completely rid of resistance, but we minimize it. And before I finish, I want to tell you something about a dream that I have, which is a blue dream. So this is the life expectancy in the world. And uh, 10 years ago, you see that the uh, the highest is over 80 in Canada, in Australia, in North Europe, several countries, even in Israel. But that's not so important. Around 80, it's all the United States and around this uh, also Europe. Even the green is not so bad, 75, which is young, but not as bad as Africa, which is still 40 to 45 years here. So my blue dream, is that they soon the event will look like all blue. So this is actually the end of my lecture. I just want to say that for re uh, materializing my blue dream, a serious commit me, commitment of the pharma companies is essential soon. And if you know, any of you know about a company that wants to go into fighting antibiotic resistance, we will be very happy to give them all what, all the data that we already have. I also want to thank the Weizmann Institute that uh, let me work, although most of the world was laughing at me and said that it was a dream. The president that made it was Michael Seller, a biologist. When his term was over, a physicist, Heimerari, agree, uh, in, did not stop, and they were a uh, encouraged by the Scientific Advisory Committee. I also want to thank Dr. Wittmann for Max Planck for Molecular Genetics in Berlin that was dreaming to see the structure of the ribosome. He arranged for us a working subunit in the synchrotron in Hamburg where we collected data, but he died 10 years before the structures came and it was replaced by Franceschi and then by Fuccini. So I had two groups, one in Hamburg in the, in the synchrotron, one in Israel. So I want to thank all the group numbers that were determined and devoted throughout the, the research. I can show you the group in Israel. It's actually a collection of, of the group last uh, uh, 10 years. And you can see with green, those that are still with us, those that they got their PhD and left. And here I want to also thank whoever um, uh, supported us and the, the places, the synchrotrons that we collected data. I want to tell you that the person that runs the group, it's not me, it's Dr. Anand Bashan. She is the senior scientist. And I cannot tell you what everybody does except for Tamar that came to us 18 years ago and uh, stays. She came, she came for 10 weeks and she's still with us. And the day that I took the picture, she had birthday and she baked the cake and this is her cake, which I can show you in a large format. And it shows that my group loves ribosomes. They are considered sweet. Also, I want to thank my family. Here you can see my daughter and granddaughter 
but I want to thank also my, my sister, my mother, and so on. And I want to tell you about my granddaughter who gave a speech about me when I got a, a, a prize in Paris. And she said about me, as you know, she, it means me, she is a very busy scientist, but she always finds time for me. And I've always admired her work. And because of that, I invited her at the age of five to the kindergarten. And they were really happy to hear about ribosomes. She also gave me a prize. This is not her prize, this is the Nobel Medal. But for me, her prize is more important, or at least as, as important. The grandma of the year is Adayonat. And when I asked her which year, and she said, you have to reprove yourself every year. If you fail, I'll take it off the wall, which she didn't do yet the last 13 years. Ribosom became popular. Here is a um, carnival. He is me. And she is the ribosome. You see here the, the dancing. The protein comes out of her. And even younger children became ribosomes. And Michelle Kishka, one of our most beloved uh, um, artist, drew me head full of ribosome. And if you look carefully, small subunit, large subunit, and symmetry, and he thinks that new antibiotics should be here, and here, and here, and here. So thank you very much. And if you have questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you so much for the illuminating talk. I think you do have uh, many questions, and I think just to take off from the ribosomes, I think we have a question from Toma Yamagoshi, who asked you, why have you decided to start working on ribosomes? I think I, I said it in the lecture, maybe it was the, the, before it. Because the, the process of, of translation of the genetic code to proteins was interesting for me. I really wanted to understand how it is being made. Thank you. I think probably he was hoping to, for a more personal uh, answer, but we'll move on to the next question. But it was interesting for me. It's personal, <laughs> isn't it? Yes, it is. I really I wanted to start. understand it. But I, 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 there were many things that I wanted to understand, but this was a global, a global question. It happens in every living cell, in bacteria, in cockroaches, in elephants, in flowers. I wanted to understand how it is being made. Thank you. So we have another question from uh, Rachanot, and he asks, what do you see in the future? Will there be any new surprises coming up on this molecule, the ribosome. It will do a lot of things we never thought of before. So what yeah, are your thoughts? Uh, there, there, are, there, are, there is research being done, not by, by us, of how the ribosome start and, and finish and so on, and all the interaction with the cell. We are working on now, which I didn't talk about at all, on diseases, human diseases that are caused by mutations of ribosomes. It's, it's unbelievable. More than 25% of the types of cancers are, uh, in, are connected to even a single mutation in the, in the ribosome, just one change. And it's, it's uh, so many types of cancers and uh, also uh, anemia. So now we are trying to understand how such small mutations can uh, cause such big problems. Maybe it will also open a way to, to, to treat them. So this is also about the uh, ribosomes. In addition, we, we think that we identified this, this little uh, construct that was prebiotic before life, making bonds, and it's still embedded in the ribosome. So it's understanding the origin of life. All these are uh, news about ribosomes. And there is also a question about ribosomes that I don't have an, an answer for. And maybe the, uh, the, the audience have. You see, a, a virus goes into the cell. Virus cannot replicate. It's not only the corona. No virus can replicate. 
but it has its genetic good. The coronavirus, the COVID-19, it has RNA as, as its uh, genetic code, but it doesn't matter, RNA or DNA. They are using the ribosomes of the, of the human cell, of the host. How do they do it? How do they uh, initiate the ribosomes and, and convince them to do theirs and not, and not what they have? And I showed that uh, the cell had to tell ribosomes to start. How do they convince the cells? Anybody has an, an answer? Maybe this is the future to answer this question. Thank you. I, we have another question, a more technical question by Siti Nobaya Oslan. Uh, she was asking, how do you determine the critical points for the potential binding sites when analyzing the ribosome of harmful against harmless bacteria? This is what we did for um, understanding resistance or, or uh, how, how, how do the harmless disturb uh, we, we compared. Okay. Um, we have a general question by Virginie Geoffrey. Uh, she asks, what do you think about alpha-4 and its future contribution in the antibiotic resistance fight? What do I think? I think that the way that the world is now suffering from it is very sad. And even more sad is that the companies don't want to do anything about it. Uh, I hope that we can do something. This is why we, we are trying so hard. Thank you. And we have a comment from uh, Mark uh, Karaskal. Oh, he said, this is a fantastic presentation. As a clinical microbiologist, I'm really supportive of the school of thought of developing or discovering narrow spectrum antibiotics rather than the wide spectrum, so as to minimize the collateral damage to the human microbiome. I'm really inspired by your way of thinking on how to approach this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> So, and we have another question uh, from Kajana uh, Bupalit. Uh, so his question is, as you mentioned, all bacterial ribosomes are similar, but not identical. What is the best way to differentiate that part? It's it, uh, connected to the level of evolution. And within the bacteria, there are differences. Uh, one can determine the structure of all if the difference has some more meaning than just the difference if it uh, influences some process, or it's enough to, to look at the sequences. Depends what, what is the aim of the result. The sequences of the proteins and of the RNA. Okay. Thank you. And now we have a question now from Mark again. So following your paradigm of using the structure of the antibiotic targets, in discovering or designing antibiotics, how long do you think will the endeavor of looking for new narrow spectrum antibiotic will take? How does this approach complement the current natural products research? I don't know what is the current uh, research. I know that the companies are making antibiotics, but the old ones, they just make most, more than them. How long will be? The specific ones that we are we are designing, I cannot say. It's not easy. Not everyone works. If it works, not always it kills the bacteria. It's a, a lot of science, a lot of research in order to make uh, each of them. But as I showed, there are already 16 that are potentially good. How long it takes, I cannot say. I never could say it in, in science. Okay, thank you. And we have another question from uh, Joram Posma. So Alexander Fleming famously warned against underdosage of penicillin once it becomes readily available. Is there a danger of underdosage with these pathogen-specific antibiotics you describe and work on? We don't know it yet. This is, this is one point that has to be checked in this in, in, uh, uh, studies very carefully. 
but we don't we don't have a product yet that we can check it. We are in the design level, in the design um, step. Okay. Um, there's a question from uh, Daniel Tay. What is the merit of focusing on developing antibiotic that targets the ribosome as compared to other groups of antibiotics? If other groups work, it's okay. We just know about ribosomes. But uh, many others work on other on, on the uh, antibiotics that work on the surface of on the diet, um, cell wall of the bacteria like penicillin. There are many, and flux, there, there are many. And I think that if all of us come up, if each of us come up with some antibiotics will be wonderful. But this is what I know to do, only ribosome. Thank you. And we have one question from uh, Yosapo. Will it now be possible to do synthetic ribosomes? If yes, how do we improve the efficiency of translation? So I think today to improve the efficiency of translation will be very difficult because it's very, very, very um, efficient machinery. But to make ribosomes or to force ribosomes to make new materials, this is going on. And to, to change uh, the, the ribosomes a little bit in, in several regions, this is going on, not by us, but people are doing it. Uh, if, it if it's going to, to be efficient, uh, I think that more efficient will be to uh, modify the genetic code or to make new genetic code or to make new amino acids that uh, uh, TRNA will be able to carry, and this is also being done, that they will be directed to specific uh, um, tasks. But to change the ribosomes, and maybe in order to make amino acids, to, to incorporate larger amino acids, if there is a, a reason for it. But not, not much. Now it's what comes into the ribosome can be changed. Thank you. We have a question from Kriza Fay Kalumba. Do you see great potential in ribosome engineered probiotics? I don't know anything about this. I'm sorry, I cannot answer this question. Okay. I think we have uh, many, many notes of uh, thank you for amazing presentations while I'm scrolling down. Uh, great talk. Wonderful. Um, and there's a question from uh, Ite Elgoff. Thank you very much for a great talk. I have a non-ribosomal question. Can you please relate to a bacteriophage-based antibiotics in the context of antibiotic safety? No, I, I can't. I can only comment about the fact that antibiotics cause, non-digestible antibiotic cause, are uh, uh, coming out into into the water system, the well water system, and depend disturbs me. But I cannot comment about everything else that was asked. Okay, thank you. And we have a question from uh, Christopher. What do you think of the possibility of using small drugs in making the viral RNA secondary structure rigid, thus the ribosome can't efficiently translate it? It can be it can be a good day, a good way to go if if uh, it's possible to make rigid RNA in the virus. Maybe then the ribosome is not needed anymore. So it will be bad enough for the virus. But I don't know how to do it. But if somebody knows, it can be a good good way. Okay, we have uh, set the last two questions here. Time is running out. Okay, the, the question from Russell. Hello, Prof. Ada. Are there any significant research endeavors regarding with the uh, ER ribosome interaction as compared, oops, as compared with the free floating ribosomes? Uh, I don't know about any. Um, ribosomes really floating, some of them, 
but others are like uh, hooked to the place they proteins that they make are known like uh, near the ear membrane and so on. I think that they are very similar in the same cell. And ribosomes can have to make proteins in all cells, even in the eye. And of course, in the eye, the, the proteins are different than in, in the muscle. But I'm not sure that ribosomes are responsible for it. What's responsible is the genetic part that is being translated. And the, the selection is by the cell, by the cell needs, which is still very open uh, research question. Well, thank you so much, Professor Ada Yonaf. We are running, we are out of time now. And now uh, we have, you have many, many messages that thank you for the wonderful lecture. And um, thank you so much for your, your, your wonderful presentation. And, you know, you have really inspired many of us here. So thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I hope that next year we'll meet in person. Yes, I hope so. Thank you. Thank you.